Okay, so I think I'm now sharing my slides with you. Uh, I'm Dr. Lena Nito. I'm the GP liaison at the Royal Victorian Ione Hospital. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today. I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal people meeting with us today. I'd like to acknowledge our speaker, Dr Anne Cass, who's generously donated her time and expertise to provide this presentation. I'd also like to thank the Northwestern Melbourne PHN for partnering with us to provide this GP education event. And we're also very grateful to the Collier Fund who have generously donated a grant to assist us to fund our GP education program. Uh, just a note to ensure that your attendance is recorded, uh, please make sure that you uh, join the session with your first and last name. If that hasn't happened, you can type your full name into the comments section so that um, Olivia from the Northwest Melbourne PHN can record your attendance. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, however, you'll notice that um, all, you're all muted and that your cameras are turned off for the whole session. So could I ask you please to write your questions in the chat section and I'll be moderating that monitoring it and interrupting Anne, our speaker, throughout her talk to uh, ask your questions. Some questions I may leave to the end, depending on the relevance to what she's speaking about at the time, but feel free to ask your questions as we go, because if you're like me, you'll forget them by the time we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, this session is being video recorded. Um, and will be made available online. I'll email my emailing list when it becomes available. Um, and that's the website link at the bottom uh, for our GP education um, information and other recorded events. Uh, you will need to register to access events, um, but once you've registered, you can access all of our past recordings. Oh, why are you so heavy today? Oops, someone is oh, not muted. Very heavy. Olivia, can you take care of that, please? Thank you. Um, this is a this QR code links to our evaluation survey. I will be showing it again at the end. Um, also, Olivia will type it in the chat section towards the end of the uh, presentation. Please complete the evaluation survey as soon as you can. We do use this feedback to plan our future events and we really value your feedback. And just a reminder, if you didn't hear me previously, please um, join the session with your first and last name or write it in the chat box so your attendance can be recorded. You'll need that if you want to get points. I'm briefly just going to show you some relevant information. This is the Ione Hospital website with the URL at the top. If you click on uh, health professionals for GPs, you get to this page. And there's lots of resources there. Um, so some on the right hand side, you can click on and if you scroll down, I'm assuming my next slide. Uh, there's referrals information, including ophthalmology primary care referral guidelines, ENT primary care referral guidelines, um, and some cochlear implant clinic guidelines. There's also referral forms. Um, and a bit more information further down, which you can open up when you're on the website. Okay, so that leads me to talk to you about Melbourne Health Pathways, provides clinicians with a single website to access clinical and referral pathways and resources at the point of care. So the idea um, is that you would use 
those when you are with patients, although you can also um, use them and read up beforehand and after. Um, the new statewide referral criteria and related clinical and referral pathways are now available across all Victorian Health Pathways websites or the equivalent. Um, So the process of developing content for health pathways is a collaborative effort between GPs, specialist services and other subject matter experts. This is not just another set of guidelines, but GPs and clinicians agreeing on what's accurate and relevant for each clinical condition and its management. Health pathways aims to enhance clinical knowledge and promote best practice, build collaboration and reduce fragmentation across the healthcare system. Health Pathways supports patients in receiving the right care in the right place at the right time. It helps patients avoid hospital admission, allowing a smoother patient journey and more efficient healthcare system, improves quality of pre-referral workup and accurate referral information, which translates to more timely care for patients or reduced reject rejected referrals and requests for more information. That's the URL to the Melbourne um, Health Pathways. To request access, you can email info at healthpathwaysmelbourne.org.au. If you are um, within the Northwest Melbourne, Eastern Melbourne, PHN catchment areas. If not, I do have, oh, I've skipped that slide, but you can contact your own PHN to get access to your local pathways. Um, I've taken a screenshot of the ENT main um, index on Melbourne Health Pathways. So if you look, you go down to the list, it's under surgical ENT, and then this is a list of conditions for which there are pathways. I think the ones that aren't highlighted are not localised yet. So then I've clicked on neck lumps in adults because that's the most relevant for this talk, although there's also neck lumps in children. Um, and I'm not sure that doesn't look highlighted. Uh, but this is just a little look at what the pathways look like and there's uh, lots of expandable um, bits where there's a little arrow you can expand for more information. They always start with the red flag, background assessment, the assessment, and then you get management, referral and other links to information. I won't go through that in, in detail. Um, because Anne's going to cover that content during her presentation on what, what we should be doing. Um, but yes, here's my slide on how you can get access to Health Pathways. Uh, you do need a login to access. If you're part of Northwest Melbourne or Eastern Melbourne PHNs, then you belong to the Melbourne Community Health Pathways and you can request access via that email or contact your local PHN. Or if you're not sure how to contact them, there is uh, a, a website there that can help you direct you where to go. So the learning objectives for tonight, I won't go through, um, they were advertised. I'd just love to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anne Cass. She's an ENT surgeon at the Royal Victorian Ione Hospital. She trained in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery in Melbourne with further subspecialty training in otoneurology. She has been in charge of the head and neck clinic at the INE Hospital since 2004, and she is an examiner for the fellowship in otolaryngology head and neck surgery. Anne runs an ENT practice in Hamilton and Warrnambool and flies a light plane between Melbourne and her rural practices. So I will stop sharing my screen now and allow Anne to do so. And I'll just let you know, uh, while you're speaking, I'm going to mute myself and also turn off my video. Um, but I will turn on my video and unmute myself as questions come up. So that's sort of a little clue to you that I want to ask you a question. Okay. Uh, stop sharing. Stop sharing. And there you go. I'll mute myself. 
Okay, thanks, Lena. Um, and thanks everyone who's um, come tonight. So I'd like to talk to you about three main areas, um, neck lumps, oral lesions, and um, general throat discomfort. So the neck lumps we'll start with, and I'd like to take an anatomical approach to neck lumps um, to give you a framework for um, your diagnosis. So for any given site in the neck, you've got a relatively narrow differential. So we classify the neck into the, um, into the um, regions 1A submental, 1B submandibular, 2A is uh, jugular digastric and 2B is further posterior superior there. And then level three, four and five in the posterior triangle. So let's start with the submental area. Um, so the differential there is, is relatively narrow, the dermoids, suprahyoid thyroglossals, um, some nodes, um, and then occasionally something rare like a ranula. And um, if it's a node, you've got um, metastatic nodes, you've got lymphomas, and then you've got atypical infections. So here, here we've got a, a picture of an adult with um, the sort of thing we're talking about. And um, it looks, without knowing for sure, it looks cystic. It's, it's very, um, very rounded and um, certainly an, a regular looking shape, isn't it? So it could be a thyroglossal duct cyst or a dermoid. And then here's a, one I had only a couple of weeks ago in a child where um, they've developed initially quite substantial lymphadenopathy with a lot of swelling. And then over a couple of weeks developed skin discoloration, um, which is classical for atypical TB. That's something that um, the sort of atypical infections you might get here would be things like cat scratch disease or toxoplasmosis. And the good thing about mixed cell population, so um, you, you don't have to worry then that it's a lymphoma. And uh, in this kid, she'd been unwell um, and then she got a tremendous amount of swelling in those local lymph nodes. And then I was very relieved to see the, um, the discoloration in the skin because I knew then it was atypical TB. Um, rather than a tumour. But I did put a needle in it and get some cells quite early on, which she um, didn't enjoy, but was able to put up with it at the age of eight. And um, this was just to show you, not that this is level one, but here's another boy with a similar thing in a parotid node. And you can see that discoloration in the skin. Um, so a little three-year-old. So we see quite a, quite a lot of that atypical TB up here. It's presumably... Um, related to cattle. Um, and um, the good thing is if we get, if we wait till they soften and we drain them, they do pretty well. So now level 2B um, around the region of the submandibular gland could be the submandibular gland itself. Sometimes older people come in and their, their glands toast, but otherwise normal. So if you, if you do a, a bimanual palpation, the floor of the mouth, you'll be able to feel that the gland actually feels normal consistency compared to the other side and not enlarged, um, but it's simply just dropped down into the neck a bit. And then of course, you'll have patients that have an obstructed submandibular gland and they'll give that classic history of, um, of pain after eating and swelling after eating. And then less often the tumor, which of course won't be painful. It'll be um, progressively enlarging, but not painful. Um, so in the submandibular gland, unfortunately, tumours have more of a tendency to be malignant. So particularly in a young woman, you might be worried about an adenoid cystic cancer if they present with a hard sort of a, a lump. And then you'll have nodes that are associated with the gland. And again, they could be metastatic or, or they could be uh, atypical infections, as we were talking about, or something like a lymphoma and the, um, and the ranula. And I think I've got, that's a toes submandibular gland, that one. And this guy's got a floor of mouth ranula. Um, so you can see the whole floor of mouth has been pushed up by this thing. That I think even on this photo, you can see that it's cystic. And then they'll get a very soft um, pseudocyst in the upper neck that goes along with that. So um, all you have to do is remove the sublingual gland because that's where the fluid's coming from. So um, 
I would just say again, any, any questions, just interrupt me, won't you? Um, so level 2A, they're the, they're the ones we see such a lot of because they're the reactive nodes um, uh, due to tonsillitis in children and, and also in adults. But also we see a group of adults that present with a node there and they've got a tonsil cancer and they very often are asymptomatic. Um, so if you see a node in this area, just look in the mouth and um, you'll be amazed how, how often <laughs> they'll turn out to have a, a completely abnormal looking tonsil. Then you get your branchial cysts in the younger adult. Um, although these days we have to be a bit careful with those because we get cystic metastases in HPV associated um, oropharyngeal cancer. And they can look for all the world like a branchial cyst. But again, if you examine a tonsil, you'll make the diagnosis. And, um, and things that are rare, carotid body tumor. I mean, you'll, <laughs> that you're not gonna see many of them in your practice lifetime. But you will see a few prominent carotids, particularly in older, skinny women, where the carotid becomes a little bit tortuous as they get older. So that's a um, that's a level two swelling. That one, not a very good photo, and that's another level two. And that one looks malignant in that it's it, it's got a solid look about it, hasn't it? And patient skinny, probably a smoker. All righty, now level three. Um, here we have um, nodes draining the hypo pharynx, larynx, thyroid, or we might get a, um, a second order node where you've got level two nodes involved already. So um, here's a classic level three. This child had an atypical TB as well. And we've drained the, um, drained the parotid swelling through a little incision, but she's still got a very large level three gland. And um, fortunately, the infection in that was central in the gland with a very thick wall so we were able to manage that conservatively and it settled down over a period of months. But the debate was whether to remove that gland or not, because with atypical TB, the antibiotics tend not to work. All righty, so level four, that's down near the thyroid. We hardly ever see anything much down there, um, you know, unless it's in the context of other levels being involved as well, or perhaps in the context of thyroid cancer. And then level five, much more important because you get that, um, the Verkovs node, the signal node from um, upper GI malignancy, also from lung and breast and um, even from um, more distant cancers. So if you see something pop up there, um, they need to be looked into pretty carefully if it's a progressive um, swelling. And then you will get some glands there from head and neck primaries, but mainly when other groups are already involved and you might get a lymphoma down there too. Um, or you might get TB. So classic cholestud abscess was TB in that node. So your approach to neck lumps, um, obviously look at the age um, and the, um, the type of patient. And then the most important thing is whether the lump is progressively enlarging and how long has it been there for? If it's fluctuating, which they usually are, um, that's not a worry. And then um, general um, features, the preceding illness, the associated tonsillitis, um, and then um, general unwellness um, and the B symptoms for lymphoma. So um, yeah, you can take a history um, with, for swallowing. You can obviously only talking to the patient, you'll detect a voice change. And um, otalgia is important because it might be referred from a, um, an otherwise asymptomatic pharyngeal problem. And then if something's tender, it's not a worry, it's um, infective. But if it's non-tender, hard, and particularly if it's fixed, um, you'll be concerned about it. I do my own FNAs. I, I don't know whether any of you do FNAs, um, but we all, we all learned to do it, I guess, in the breast clinic when I was um, training and just a two mil syringe and a blue needle um, in an obvious lump, I think you can do a very good job yourself, but you, you do need the glass slides and the fixative. So, um, but it's quite a nice technique to do if you, if you are keen to do a bit of practical stuff. Now, thyroid lumps. Now, thyroid lumps are often found by accident, um, particularly when someone gets an ultrasound or a CT scan for non-specific throat symptoms. And, um, so there might be a single lump or it might be multiple lumps. 
If they're multinodular, in my experience, they're almost never um, anything to worry about. So as you know, um, in this situation, the ultrasound guided fine needle is very helpful. Um, if it's, but I think the important thing is with thyroid lumps, if you can't make a definite diagnosis, it's best just to sit back and wait because um, the thyroid disease tends to get over-treated and over-investigated. So you'd be much more worried if someone comes in and reports a lump that's getting bigger than if it's found incidentally. And I mean, that applies to everything in medicine, I think. Um, but the cancer itself is often quite indolent and doesn't um, threaten your life. So you can manage them for a period if, um, if the FNA doesn't tell you definite malignancy. Yes, Olivia. Yeah, we we just have a question. Where can we learn FNA technique? Is is the question that we've got. Yeah, look, I reckon um that um you could go along to the head and neck clinic at Peter Mac. Um they run their own FNA biopsies. Sam Flatman's the guy. He's he's an ENT surgeon, but he's he's done further training in um, ultrasound guided FNA, and um, then I just think if you attached yourself to Sam's clinic, um, or even came into my clinic at the Eye but we mightn't get any lumps that were suitable. <laughs> That's the only trouble. Whereas yeah. Sam would definitely have something that was suitable. Yeah, we, Lena, it might be worth talking to Sam about that. Because I, I think yeah. it's a procedure that you can, it doesn't worry the, the patient. Other, I mean, we're digressing, Anne, but the other thing is, is it something that we could maybe video record you doing sometime and then yeah. make it accessible on the website? That might be a project for us to do. Yeah, because like I say, you only need, you know, two mil syringe, blue needle, um, and then your glass slides and some fixative. And yeah, then you might, it's, it's probably a two minute video. We could probably organise that at some stage. I'll, I'll follow up with you <laughs> at some stage then, Anne. Um, can you please send out the contact details of, of that person that runs that clinic was the, the next question. So maybe um, if you send that on to Olivia, yeah. the name, yeah. then um, that can come out with our follow-up email. Yeah, because I think if, you, if someone walks into your clinic and they've got something you're worried about, you can get an answer in three or four days. And, you know, it, it's a lot quicker than waiting for them to go off and see someone, isn't it? Although I guess you can always refer them to a radiology service and, and get them to do it. Hmm. Absolutely. I think it's nice to do things yourself. I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just if you're not doing a lot of them, yeah, then it's, it's easier to um, send them off to radiology. But certainly, like you say, if something's really obviously there, you, yeah. It's doable. All right, I'll turn off now. You keep going, please. Okie dokie. Yeah, so the, um, I guess what I'm saying about thyroid cancer is um, don't stress about it too much if it's an incidental finding, and particularly if it's multinodular. Um, you know, there's no hurry. There's no hurry to, um, to look into these things normally. Because, and I'll often wait six months and re-ultrasound and see if they're growing. Um, unless the FNA is absolutely um, high level. So, yeah. All righty. Now we'll move on to the mouth. Um, so oral ulceration drives us all nuts, I think, really, um, because we're not dental surgeons. So, but there, I mean, there are um, common oral ulcers that we deal with that, that would make up most of them. So are they single or multiple? Are they, is it recent or has it been chronic and recurring? If it's the latter, it's not a worry. Um, you know, the usual thing. If you feel it and it's, um, it's hard, particularly if it's got a visibly rolled edge, that's a worry. Um, also have a look at the teeth and see if there's a sharp tooth somewhere around. So that, yeah, because that's the most common. Um, the dental ulcer is um, the one that we see the most. And, the thing is, even if you um, even if you get it to heal, if they've still got a sharp edge on their teeth, um, it might come back again, or it may it may not heal until you get the tooth fixed up. 
So SCC, usually smokers and drinkers, but not always. Um, we see some young women that get um, SCC that are not, uh, that don't have a past history like that. And the other one I wanted to mention is necrotizing silometaplasia, which looks for all the world like an SCC. It's, it looks horrible, but you can take a little biopsy and, and it turns out just to be this and it gets better by itself. So it's worth just, that's something to have in the back of your mind, I suppose. Um, so there's a palatal ulcer. I think that is a silo metaplasia, that one. So if they're multiple, um, you know, obviously viral is the commonest thing if it's acute. Um, and then you've got to think about drug reactions and systemic disease. So immune suppression is an obvious one. And then the um, autoimmune diseases. Um, nutritional deficiency, I don't think I see that much, but um, there may be some populations where you'd see that. So what's important not to miss would be pemphigus. Um, so that'll be acute and progressive, and they, they can get into real trouble because of dehydration. So they'll have a crop of ulcers, nasty-looking ulcers, and, and possibly some skin involvement, that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's the one that that's the one that can really um, acutely affect you um, in terms of being life threatening. Yes, Lena. Sorry, um, and it, presumably that's very painful. The pen, pen, yeah, I, I, I imagine so. I think the patient's just really unwell, um, yeah. but you can't imagine that wouldn't be painful, can you? Mm. Yeah, we're not going to miss this, I don't think. I don't reckon. Um, I think it's it's just, I suppose, having it in the back of your mind, isn't it? Especially if they've turned up with skin lesions as well. And it's sort mm -hmm. of leading me on to my next um, point, which is, you know, that if in doubt, just take a little punch biopsy, you know, of anything. Um, so I'm probably going to talk about that in a minute. So pemphigoid is the one where you, um, you get the deeper ulcers, but they're not life-threatening and relatively good prognosis, but they can look pretty nasty. And I'm not sure what that one was meant to be. I think that's multiple small ulcers. Okay, so common conditions account for most of them. Um, the aphthous ulcers, the lichen planus and the dental ulcers. So there's, some, there's an aphthous ulcer there. They are usually relatively small, unless they're a giant aphthous ulcer, in which case they can be very big, but usually small and heal quite quickly. Um, and the, um, yeah, the major ones are quite impressive um, when you see those. So pain relief, a bit of topical steroid. Um, the Amlexinox, now I'm interested, I'm, I'm not sure it's called aphthosol, it's certainly available overseas, but as a paste, but I'm not sure if we can even get it in Australia. Um, I don't know, Lena, are you aware of um, aphthosol? No, I don't know it, but I'll, I'll look it up while you're talking and we'll see. Yeah, I think people can probably mail order it, mail order it from overseas, you know. Yeah, anyway, um, so counselling about natural history and it's often stress-related, as you all know. Yeah, so there's a, another one on the cheek. Um, the lichen planus, um, pretty common and can be erosive and painful. It's difficult then um, to treat. And um, there are a couple of different forms, but the reticula is the one that we see mainly. So they can be pretty sore and um, they can occasionally transform and become malignant, but it's the pain's the main thing. Um, so you can use some topical steroid or even some systemic shit steroid as a short course and um, any sort of analgesia. Yeah, so that's there's a um, reticular one. And um, yeah, some of these we see on an annual basis and just make sure that they're not sort of um, developing at all into anything else. Yeah, but look, I think the take-home message from all of this is if, um, if you're in doubt, it's, it's so easy just to do a little punch biopsy. So a bit of local, um, one of those little punches and, um, and then just let it bleed. It'll bleed for a few minutes and then it'll stop and, um, and you can get your answer. 
So again, you need a little bit of equipment, but not too much. Um, yeah. Um, it looks like you can buy it uh, on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, at the soul. Yeah. 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 yeah it supposedly works. And you'd buy it as a paste. You'd get the paste, I think, rather than the oral paste. Oral one. Yeah. Can I? I ask, um, I'm not sure if you're going to cover this, but I often or I commonly see patients who get recurrent multiple oral abscess ulcers. Um, mm -hmm. what, what can we do for those people? Well, we can give them counselling about their stress um, because I think that's a big part of it. And um, sometimes I've resorted to giving them little short courses of oral steroids, but... Um, yeah, I, th I just think it's a sign that it's a sign of stress. Usually, it's that sort of patient that comes in um, with it. Mm. And should should we be worried about anything else, like that they may have, um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease or something like that? Oh, in my experience, no. But um, but I suppose I think you should take a history. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I, th I think in the absence of any bowel symptoms. Um, you, you could probably be pretty happy. Yeah. But there's no doubt some of those bowel things can cause oral ulceration, but the recurrent aphthia are usually pretty, pretty classic. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. No worries. Yeah, so I'd like I'd love all of you to go go home and biopsy anything in the mouth that you don't like the look of because it just takes all the stress out of it then. Um, that's certainly what I do. You've only got to take a little piece from the edge of the ulcer and and send it off and um yeah people worry about bleeding but it's never a problem absolutely never so that's something that yeah are you going to ask something? Uh, I've, I've missed a few questions here sorry but um someone's asked about skin and eye evidence of pemphigus not familiar only know about catalog do you have other topical suggestions yeah, kenalog's the main one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And how to how to treat lesions from hand, foot, and mouth disease? Oh, good question. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you guys would know more than that. Yeah. I so I, I, I was going to say I I see this a lot when I work at the children's clinic. Yeah. And um, you know, I always explain to patients that that really that there is no specific treatment. This GP has mentioned Bongella and SM33. Mm. I have the advantage of I've got access to the lignocaine um, oral gel, the xylocaine viscous, um, and so I send them home with a little um, tiny bit of that for the parents to apply on a finger four times a day just to try and increase fluid intake. But I believe someone did a study and it didn't make any difference to, to oral intake. So just plenty of pain relief, however you can do it. I think even just um, regular paracetamol or ibuprofen um, yeah, just to keep the fluids up. What we find with tonsillectomy, you know, with that big ulcer that you've got from a tonsillectomy is that, is that Panadol acts on, as a surface agent. So if you deliver Panadol as a soluble in an adult or a syrup in a child and they can hold it in their mouth for long enough, it actually works you know, on the surface before it goes through okay. the bloodstream. So we find really that interesting. And even I can tell you from personal experience when I had my tonsils out, it definitely works. So awesome. Yeah. So it's worth a try. But um, no. more question. <laughs> where do you where do you take the punch from? Center versus edge? Do you need another one? Yeah, no, I just take it Good from side. the edge, yeah. Ideally the edge, but center's better than better than nothing. Mm, yeah yeah um recurrent recurrent oral ulcers painful recurring on the same spot every few weeks no dental injury yeah um, that's, i'm assuming that's, they're saying what could that be yeah no i think that's 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 an aphthous thing mm. yep uh, oh, and to buy oral ulcers are terrible aren't they everyone knows that <laughs> yeah do we do we biopsy the tongue okay, yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. Is it very, I mean, it, I, yeah. I imagine it would bleed a lot. No, it does for a minute, but it's it's really not a problem. I've never had to okay. put a stitch in a punch biopsy. And I do a lot, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can always get them to awesome. some ice or something. Mm. Yeah. 
or get them to squeeze um, it with the gauze for a few minutes. And question mark, four millimetre punch? Oh, no, just whatever size you feel like you need. So, you know, I would just, a three would be fine for most yeah. oral things. The biggest, yeah. yeah. And the, do you use local anaesthetic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would definitely use a bit of local. Yeah. Yeah, great. It'd be kinder, wouldn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think that's it. I'll let you go on. Yep, if all I right. If any, I'll get people to re retype it for me. Yep, no worries. All righty. Um, now I was going to talk to you about Globus because we all see lots of this, especially during um, during the um, COVID. The incidence of Globus went up significantly. I'm, I'm not sure if that was your experience in general practice, but yeah, a lot of the a uh, lot of the specialists said. So foreign body sensation at the level of the cricoid cartilage, worse when you're swallowing saliva, but relieved by eating. And um, it's due to the failure of relaxation of your cricopharyngeus. So it's one of those muscles that's got auto automatic and um, unfortunately some um, non-automatic supply, um, nervous supply. So, so it'll fluctuate and it won't be progressive and there won't be any associated weight loss. And in fact, some of them may have gained weight, which has increased some reflux and that's um, triggering a bit of globus. So usually you can nail that on the history quite well. Um, whereas if they did have a post cricoid cancer, they'll have the progressive dysphagia for solids, they'll have the weight loss and, um, and it's, it's not gonna happen very often, but if it does, you've often got a history of iron deficiency syndromes in the past. So my whole career, I've only had about two patients who presented with what seemed like globus initially and turned into um, post cricoid cancer. So luckily it's, um, it's something we always worry about, but it's not, uh, not likely. So if you have pharyngeal symptoms and you want to investigate, is it worth doing a CT? No, I'll just say no. Barium swallow makes some sense, although it's been hard to get those lately. But the best thing to do really is just take the good history and, and um, you know, examine the patient. And I, I suppose if you're really worried, we can do a, an endoscopy. But um, you should be able to rule out most of them on, on the, examine, on the um, history. So that which brings me to why do I enjoy ENT and why I think why everyone in general practice can enjoy ENT because we don't have to use many tests. Um, we take a history. We examine the patient and obviously we're well set up to do that um, because we've got good equipment, but, but really um, we very rarely have to re resort to tests. So I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping you can all um, maybe do a few more procedures if you feel like it. And then I think my last slide is a baby owl that I saw yesterday. So there you go. I just thought I'd bring him oh. in because he's so beautiful. Wow, he, he's very camouflaged, isn't he? Yes, isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> Lovely. All righty. So, yeah, any questions? Okay, yes. I like ENT, like eyes, because what you see is what you get. Awesome. That was a comment. <laughs> yeah, and I think it lends itself very much to general practitioners having a little bit of a subspecialty interest and having other other GPs in the practice maybe sending people to one person who you know develops a bit of a a bit of an interest in ENT a bit like dermatology and, and eyes in that way and um, you know you might get yourself a, a viroscope and get good at cleaning the ear out and buy a couple of tools so um yeah it's nice to um, send someone out that you've cured, isn't it? You know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, but most and of I mean, the time the we don't. Yeah, you don't get to don't get to do that as much as we do. Because we had a lot of people come in with a blocked ear or something, and when they walk out the door, they're fixed, which is great. Um, agree, Anne. Someone said we, we call ourselves GP special interest, GPSI, GPs with special interests, and it does help 
to have some special equipment like slit lamps and things. Mm. And obviously it also depends where you work a little bit. Yeah, it does a bit, but I think everyone can, I don't know, I think everyone can do a bit bit, bit of practical stuff in the rooms if they um, if they feel like they want to. Yeah, if you choose to, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm just seeing if we're getting any more questions. What I might do in case people sign off is bring up some of my slides and bring up that QR code or is... Do you want me to hold... Um, stop sharing? Stop sharing. Yep. Um, and that way if anyone wants to start filling in their, um, their feedback survey, that would be great. Okay, so that's the QR link to the evaluation survey. Um, it will also be emailed tomorrow if you um, don't want to do it now, although I just always find it's good to do it straight away while it's fresh in your brain. Um, also, those who aren't on my mailing list, if you want to sign up to get my emails, then just email me at gpliaison at ionia.org.au. Um, PDF handouts will be emailed as well hopefully tomorrow, but maybe next week. And I will email my emailing list when the video recording is available. Uh, thank you. Let me go back. Um, I'll just have a look and see if there's any further questions. Can I see? Yes, I can. So Olivia's put the uh, evaluation survey URL link in the chat. And you can click on that also or copy and paste that. Um, all right, here we've got a question for you, Anne. What should GPs do for the wax pack ears in child who's not cooperating for syringing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think syringing is great for children. Um, so often the wax is quite close to the, to the end of the canal, but, you know, it's hard to do much about it if you haven't got two hands. So... Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, yeah. Very tricky. I mean, I suppose very tricky. it's probably in some ways it's better to ask the parent just to use a bit of um, of the wax sole or some olive oil and and see if you can just get it to drain out. I mean, you know, it depends on your motivation for getting it out. It's if it's just to see the eardrum, you can do your tuning fork tests, and um, you know, I suppose it's it's not that often. 100% important to see the eardrum, um, you know, if a kid's, if they're really sick and they're febrile, you're probably going to treat them anyway. <laughs> yeah. Most of the earaches I see are referred, I might say, too. So, you know, in children, most of the earaches I see are due to tonsillitis rather than ear infections these days. Yeah. Unless, obviously, there's a history of um, pus pouring out the ear. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if your motivation is just to see the eardrum, I would say, you know, if there's no hearing loss, eardrum's probably okay. If your motivation... I think that the situation often is that the child's febrile and they've come yeah. in and, uh, and uh, they've come in, the parents have brought them in specifically for us to either rule in or rule out at, at, at otitis media. Um, and that's always tricky. Um, yeah, look, I think, I think that the, one of the most important things is to examine the tonsils because if they're covered with pus, um, you know, they may well be the cause of the earache. <laughs> in yeah. my experience, that's more common. And often the, the tonsils don't get examined in that situation. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, it's hard to examine the tonsils with a wooden tongue depressor. So we always use plastic or metal. So we can slide it back and get them to gag. Okay. Oh, I see, because it doesn't slide. It doesn't slide. Mm. So if you're under um, three, um, or three and under, you're very unlikely to open your mouth up very well without a gag, a gag reflex. Yeah. Um, you just have to be really aggressive and at the outset and make them gag, unfortunately. Yeah, you do. And you've got to get their parents to hold them and hold their arms. Yeah. And yeah, yep. and that. you got it. 
and you've got to have really quick vision. Yes. And imprint the image on your brain while you analyse it. Um, other questions. What do you use for OE if you can't confirm no perforation? Oh, um, radio. So if the canal's swollen, I think the diagnosis is pretty clear. Um, I mean, if you use Cipro, you, it doesn't matter if they've got a perforation. So yeah. if it's bacterial, you're going to have canal swelling and then you'll use Cipro because it's bacterial. If it's fungal, you won't have canal swelling, but you'll just have a whole lot of um, debris down there. And then um, it's been a problem lately because we haven't been able to get local court and via form. So I've yeah. been using Canestin liquid, which has on, Ooh, the box, okay. on the box that you should never use this in the air. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, what have we got? Especially post erty we see these often these days. I'm assuming that's the wax. Oh, what do you, sorry, what advice do you give for eustachian tube dysfunction, especially post erty We see that a lot. Yeah, look, um, it depends on how, how soon it is and how terrible the patient's feeling. But if it's really driving them mad, I'll give them a bit of oral steroid. If, um, mm -hmm. you know, if they're just going crazy. But with mm -hmm. anyone that's coping all right, you know, it's just a matter of telling them it's going to take quite some weeks to settle down. Yep. And, um, you know, you might want to get them using some saline and some Nasonex, but, um, but it's more just a passage of time. Yeah. yeah. I, certainly, um, I, I certainly I um, certainly would uh, encourage patients to use um, nasal washouts they definitely can make some difference if there's a bit of mucus clogging things up at that at, oh, at the if time. If I get a cold, Lena, I use saline every yeah. few hours uh, to my stop GP it from turning into got, a... Mm. Yeah, got me onto that. Um, a child with suspected thyroglossal duct cyst, should we get an ultrasound to confirm or just refer to ENT? Oh, yeah, you can get an ultrasound, yeah, yeah. And, and then what the, the beauty of the ultrasound is they'll be able to look at the um, and see if they've got normal thyroid tissue as well. Yeah. And um, usually they could make the diagnosis on an ultrasound and you haven't got any radiation. So it's not much downside to that. But if it moves with tongue protrusion, it's probably going to be a thyroglossal. Yes. Mm. Yes, it's pretty obvious usually. Uh, why is Cipro eardrops a nine-day course? What happens if you use for longer than nine days? So I wasn't aware of that, Anne. You know what oh, no, about. we just use them for however long they're needed. So yeah. we sometimes use them for several weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone said, sorry, what was the antifungal for ot otitis externa? Oh, I've been using Canestin liquid, which is the $10 one that you use for toenails. And it's got right. on the box, do not use in the ear. Okay. <laughs> and the reason I'm using that is because local court and via form has been unavailable and the kennecomb's too thick so you need something watery yeah mm. it works pretty well actually <laughs> but one of the problems with fungal is that a lot of them won't get well when i say a lot um there's a number that won't get better until you clean their ear out thoroughly and that's not easy to do <laughs> yeah you've sort of yeah. got to have a suction machine or a headlight or yeah that enable yeah. to get down near the drum. Yeah, and I think that's the point, isn't it? That um, sometimes we do just have to refer these on because they they really do need need suctioning. Yeah, yeah. Either that, or like I say, you know, have a designated ENT person in the practice that um, comes to the eye ear and does a bit of training and yeah. gets a voroscope, you know. And yeah, I mean, it's not rocket science, all that. Yeah. But it yeah. does take a bit of practice, definitely. Yeah. And uh, use of earwigs in OE, OE. Yeah, fantastic. If you've got canal swelling, um, it can be a way of where you're dealing with the swelling and then you put the drops in onto the wick and they work better. And then when you pull the wick out, it often removes a lot of the debris. So that's, that's something that you can do in yeah. general practice um, without any special equipment, really. Yeah. And what do you dip an odor wick in before you insert it into the ear canal? 
Yeah, don't dip it before you put it in or it'll swell up. Yeah. So pop it in and then See, and then stick and then something add, add the drops. Yeah. Exactly. And then it swells up when it's already in play. Yeah, when it's in the right yeah. spot. Yeah. Oh, they're fantastic. Idleworks are amazing. Mm. Yeah, they're a wonderful, a wonderful thing. <laughs> Yeah, but that again, that's something you can do in general practice, and it, you know, and you get yourself out of out of trouble um, with a, a nasty otitis externa. Because I know how hard it is sometimes to get people in, to get to get them seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've got another question: Is there anything we can do to help patients who get frequent tonsillo lifts? Yeah, to take their tonsils out. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, some of them get discomfort, some of them get terrible halitosis and um, there's really no answer to it, unfortunately, mm -hmm. unless they want to dig them out themselves with a spoon. Yeah. I won't tell them that. They'll be, <laughs> they probably will do it. Oh, they do it themselves anyway. Don't, don't, yeah. don't worry about that. Yeah. It actually surprises me that more people don't present with tonsillar lids because they really are horrible. You know, the breath is terrible. It's just, it's just a terrible smell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should get nausea allowance for taking out tonsils like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just mm -hmm. to... Mm Everyone's run out of things. I, I think we've run out of questions. I was going to say that that's the beauty of having to be masked up these days. That, that um, you can't you smell it. Can't smell things so much. Breath yeah. or whatever it is, whatever it is that that doesn't yeah, smell that's pleasant. True. Um, yeah, I think we're we've. Uh, we're out of questions, so I'm going to say thank you to our speaker, Dr. Anne Cass, for a wonderful presentation and answering all those questions. Thank you also to Sadi and Olivia and the team at the Northwestern Melbourne PHN for all their support in bringing you this webinar and their ongoing support with our GP education program. Thank you all for attending and contributing. Um, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. So please click on the, or have a look at the QR code and have a look at our evaluation. Um, oh, someone's got a joke for you. I saw the joke, it's quite funny. What did one tonsil say to the other? Oh, I missed it. What? What is it? Oh, get ready. The doctor's taking out us out tonight. <laughs> That's quite awesome. good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we'll pay that one. Yeah. Okay. All right, then. All Thanks, right. everybody. I think that we'll... So I'll send you stuff. Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you everyone for attending. That's Thank great. you so much, Anne. My pleasure. Right.